of y'all are thankful for Jesus. Oh, I tell you what. Mm. And how many of you just have trouble finding words to express exactly how you feel about him? I mean, you just, you do. You, I do anyway. I just struggle. I, I try, but that's why I pray in tongues a lot. Because, <laughs> you know, when you get caught up praying in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, that's, that's just your most holy faith. Amen. Praise God. What a good thing to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I went to the grocery store yesterday. I was planning on buying seedless grapes. Yep. You know what happened. I came home with Oreos. <laughs> oh. So, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your loving kindness to us. We do worship you, Father. And I am so glad that we are able to turn to you. You're always there. I think about Jehoshaphat, and he got everybody together, and he just got everybody to take and turn their eyes and put their eyes upon the Lord. And then the victory, the triumph. So, Father, we do. We put our eyes on you. We praise you and we worship you. We say thank you over and over and over again. Our hearts are just overwhelmed with gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for heaven, for eternity in heaven because of Jesus. And thank you that while we're here on this earth, we get to be your light. We get to shine. We get to make a difference. And Father, for like these, these young ones that have just graduated from, from high school, and they get to go out into the world and impact the world. They get to make a difference, and we thank you for that. But Father, that's true for every one of us. No matter where we are in our walk, no matter where we are in our life, we get to make a difference. We get to impact this world. And Father, I thank you for trusting, uh, trusting us to get it done. Thank you for the grace of the Holy Spirit working on us and through us to get it done. And we just purpose and determine to be about your business. And we realize that it's not in our own strength and it's not in our own ability, but it's what you've given to us, what you've done for us. And I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. When Carol Lee, when you got up here and you just started talking, it reminded me of my sermon, you know, um, just staying grounded. And I, I'd like to talk to us today about um, stay the course. Just stay the course. Um, Stick with what God has for you to do. Stay the course. And we all have a different race to run. We all have a different course that we're on. But stay the course. Stay the course. Don't, don't get pulled off. There's so many things that pull us. There's so many voices today. There's so much pressure today in the world in which we live in. And it's vital for us as believers to stay the course. Just to keep going the way that God wants us to go. And how many of you know that there are literally hundreds of great God ideas that are happening all over the United States and around the world right now in churches. Great God ideas. They're wonderful God ideas. And he's got all these different churches doing all these different things. Hallelujah. And how many of you know we won't ever do most of them? You know why? Because they're not what he has for us to do. See, we want to stay the course. And that, that doesn't just apply to churches. That applies to individuals. There's other people that have certain things that they're supposed to be doing and they're passionate about, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to stop your course to go do theirs. Keep running your course. And part of it is to trust God, to trust God. If we can trust God, you know, sometimes we think we all got to be running the same course, but it'll be amazing as we watch him pull everything together, how your course that was over there and how this person's course that was over there how they wove together and how one impacted the other even when they seemed like they were so far apart from each other. Seemed like they didn't have anything in common, yet God was orchestrating things. So, so part of it is, and, and don't take this wrong, in sometimes, how many of you know sometimes we got to keep ourselves out of the way even though we're involved? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? 
Sometimes people say, off with your heads. No, not off with your heads. We still need to use our minds. God gave us a mind. It needs to be renewed and all of that. But sometimes, here's what I'm trying to say, sometimes we come up with our own plan. No, 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 I don't want to come up with my own plan. God's got a much better one, amen? Hallelujah, and I love the verse of Scripture where Jesus said, um, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. Come to me and learn from me. You know, when we come to him and we learn from him, and then he says this, he says something that's so interesting, and take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Take my yoke upon you. You know what? We all have a unique yoke. I I don't hear a lot of ministers talk about what that yoke is, but over praying and studying and digging into it, I simply believe that the yoke that we're supposed to take on is God's plan for our own individual life. I am not supposed to wear David's yoke. I couldn't. <laughs> Amen. And, and let us demonstrate that. <laughs> but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wear that yoke. And David couldn't wear mine. And I can't wear Gabe's yoke. Or Diana's yoke. I got my own. Y'all got your own. And you know what? It's cut perfect just for you. It fits you. And here's the beautiful thing about that. Jesus said, you know, my yoke is easy and my burden light. So man, if stuff starts getting hard and heavy, we ought to, whoa, wait a second. What's going on here? Jesus, you said, When I come to you and I learn from you and I take that yoke upon me, that my yoke upon me, that it's easy and it's light, it's getting hard and heavy. What's going on here? Jesus, I need you to talk to me. Holy Spirit, visit with me. Because it's getting hard and heavy and I know this isn't your plan. And and I tell you what, God's plan works so much better. It works so much better. And, And his plan is crazy sometimes. It's just crazy to the natural. Do you know that there's only been one military force in the world that ever used the same strategic um, strategy that Jehoshaphat used? Or not Jehoshaphat, Joshua used? Marching around the city seven times in seven days in silence, and on the last day they shouted? Have you seen any other military forces use that? Mm -mm. No. Why? Because that was God's plan for them at that time. Amen? So it's catching what he has for us to do. So if you would, please, take your Bibles and open up to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I don't have too many verses of Scripture to go to today, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a short sermon. (laughs) (sighs) Hallelujah. Preachers can make a a short story long. But I also understand this. You know what's worse than listening to a boring preacher? <laughs> My wife's, I wouldn't know about that, honey. <laughs> Being married to one now, that's not funny. <laughs> Actually, it is. <laughs> oh. What's worse than listening to a boring speaker is listening to a long-winded boring speaker. (laughs) And you know what's worse than that? Being the long-winded boring speaker. Oh, so anyway, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Verse, we can just pick it up. Oh, let's pick it up at verse 48. We'll pick it up here. I'll catch us up on the story. They're, they're traveling back home, Jesus, and his folks, they're traveling back home. Many of you are familiar with this, verse 48. Uh, uh, Jesus got lost, he got separated from them, and uh, they're traveling, couldn't find him, so they had to go back, verse 48. So when they saw him, after searching for him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I sought you uh, uh, anxiously. And Jesus said to them, why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? I love that answer. I must be about my father's business. And I've let that sink down and get on the inside of me, as I know many other people in here have. You've just let that sink down and get inside. I must be about my father's business. It's just, for me, it's a core thing of life. I must be. Stay the course. I must be about my father's business. 
because that's what matters. That's what makes the greatest difference. That's what gets the most done is being about my father's business. The day that Diana and I got married, um, Pastor Bill Savory asked us if we wanted to say some words to each other, you know, just kind of at the moment. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd do that. And I remember I told Diana, I said, sweetheart, I purpose to keep Jesus Christ first place in my life because I know if I keep Jesus Christ first place in my life, I'll have more to give to you. Having him first place in my life makes me a better husband, makes me a better dad, and, and done that. And now that's ours back and forth to each other. We both purpose to keep Jesus Christ first place in our lives because we know as a result of that, we have more to give to each other. We're better for each other. And do you know that is part of our father's business? I'm supposed to love her like Christ loves the church. Amen. Hallelujah. So anyway, must be about my father's business. I want to just back up and I, I find something interesting in verse 49. How many of you are familiar with these passages of scripture? Okay. And he said to them, why do you seek me? Why do you seek me? Jesus, it sounds like, is a little bit like, why are you seeking me? Didn't you know where I'd be? Didn't you know what he'd be up to? He's a little bit surprised even that they're seeking him. He's like, I don't get it. I got to be about my father's business. He was just, he had that settled on the inside and it surprised him, I believe, from his question that, didn't you know where I'd be? Didn't you know what I'd be up to? I'd be up to my father's business. I'd be doing what he has for me to do. I don't know why you're looking at me. I'm right, just right where I'm supposed to be, the Father's business. Amen? It, it just was on the inside of him. I must be about my Father's business. And I think about this. This is interesting. This is, this is you know, he's 12 years old. And, and, and he goes home and he's obedient. But it's in, isn't it interesting we don't hear much more about him until later on in life? Until he gets older, until he starts his ministry, till he's about 30. What was he doing for those 18 years? What was he doing for those 18 years that we, that we don't read about? I can tell you what he was doing. He was about his father's business. Part of his father's business was honoring his mom and dad. That was part of it. Another part of his business was getting to know his father in heaven even more. I'm convinced you know, he's already astonishing the teachers. But I'm convinced he even spent more time in the Word. He spent more time in the Word. I I'll bet you he spent more time reading the Old Covenant. He spent time getting to know this book, the Old Covenant that was available to him. He spent time, and you know what he read about in there? He read about himself. He read about his life. He read about God's plan for him. Do you know what you and I can find here in the scriptures? And, and we've got the new covenant also now. You know what we can find about? We can find about our life. We can find out about who we are in Christ Jesus. We can find out that we're a head and not a tail, above and not beneath. We can find out that we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. We can find out that we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We can, we can read about ourselves. We can find out who we are. Because we're going to need that to stay the course. We're going to need it to stay the course. Just keep a marker right here because we're going to come back to Luke chapter 4. But back up with me to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. He was about his father's business. I'm convinced he was reading the word. We'll look at that just, just for a brief second here. But I, I, a lot of the scriptures, once we get past these next few scriptures, the mo rest of them are going to have a theme. They're all going to be saying kind of the same thing. And it, everything has to do with stay in the course. Just stick with it. Amen. Hallelujah. What do you do when, when you're going along and it seems like the Lord's not talking to you? Stay the course. You know, we're, we're going to finish this building here and there's been a lot of energy and focus and time put on it and everything. And I was praying about it and I've heard other pre preachers talk about this and they're like, you know, when you get in a building project, you want to make sure when you get done with it, you got something that you're ready to step into next. Because lots of times there's so much energy put into the building project that when that gets done, it's like, oh, we can rest. 
No, you can't. You're right. But lots of times people do. And I was just praying about that. And I said, okay, God, it's, you know, it's getting closer. It's getting closer. What do we do? And he just, he reminded me. Keep teaching, keep doing what I told you to do years ago. Stay the course. Preach the word. Worship him in spirit and in truth. And he put it in my heart. He put it in my heart real clear. He, it was this. He said, I was listening to a teaching by Jim Caseman, and he was talking about Dad Hagen, and, and uh, the Lord told Kenneth Hagen Sr., um, teach my people faith. And that's the Bible school that I went to, Rama Bible Training Center. And I'm, you know, just, we just moved to Custer. The church is maybe two, three years old. And what am I supposed to be doing, God? I don't know about you, but I check in. I check in. And, and he just spoke to my heart through this teaching. I want you to teach people faith. And I want you to do it two ways. From behind the pulpit and then how you live. And the other day when I asked him, you know, I think it was the day before yesterday. Teach faith. From the word. And by the way you live. Amen? So we got stuff to do. Amen? How many of you know he's going to put some other things in there? But we're, we're, we're just going to stick with what he told us to do. Hallelujah. Amen. So did you get to Matthew chapter 3? Hallelujah. Jesus was obedient to his parents. What did he do for those 18 years? I'm convinced he just kept drawing closer to God. Just drawn closer to God. How many of you know it's never wrong to draw closer to God? <laughs> you can never go wrong praying. You can never go wrong reading your Bible. Amen? I mean, just, just having that heart and that hunger for Him. So here we are in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, and Jesus is getting baptized. I'll just start at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee. To John at the Jordan to be baptized by him and John tried to prevent him saying I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me John understood who Jesus was but Jesus answered and said to him permit it to be so now isn't that crazy Jesus also recognized the office of John and honored it permit it to be so how many of you hear the question in that you know, he's not just telling him, but it's like, John, would you permit it to be so? He understands his office. Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Hmm. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I love that passage. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> what had Jesus done up to this point? He was about his father's business. We don't read about any of his ministry before this. So what was he doing? Getting to know his father, reading the word. How many of you know that's pleasing to the father? This fellow did a study, and he studied 300 of the top leaders in the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, 300 of them, studied out their lives, and he found out that 25% of them, at the end of their life, were still walking with the Lord. 25%. I mean, 75% weren't. 25% were still walking with the Lord at the end of their life in the Scriptures. And then he studied out those 25%. What is it that they all had in common? Here's one thing they all had in common. They kept their relationship with God current. They never let their fellowship and their friendship with their Father God get stale. They stayed in there. And how many of you know they're, they're no different than us? How many of you know they had to plow through some dry times? <laughs> how many of you know you're going to plow through some dry times? I remember what Breezy, if she was sitting here one time, she said this. She said, you know, Dad, uh, um, it just seems to me, and maybe God put it in her heart, but she passed it on to me, and she said, you know, I, I run into those dry times and everything, and I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying, but I do it anyway. And I'm pretty sure the Lord dropped it in her heart that, that, that those are the times that are really pleasing to him. 
when it, our feelings tell us everything else, but we just do it anyway. We just do it anyway because we're going to, what, stay the course. Man, one of the greatest things I can encourage you to do is keep your relationship with Jesus. Keep your relationship with God current and up to date. Keep that friendship, that connection going. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The branch apart from the vine, you know what's going to happen to it. It's going to stop producing. It's going to wither up and dry. Amen? So, we're here for a reason. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus, those years, those 18 years that we don't get to read much about. Hanging out with the Father, getting to know. And it, it, look, look at how important it was. You just jump down to chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. I want you to do something if you haven't in your Bible. I want you to underline, If you are the Son of God. In that verse of scripture. And there's a reason to underline it. Because do you know that was Satan's first temptation presented to Jesus? Now, when you have your Bible broken up, it puts different temptations. But that was the first one. If you look at it closely and if you think about it, what did God just get done saying in the end of chapter 3? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Satan comes along and says, if you are the Son of God. What's he trying to get Jesus to do? Doubt who he is. Because if he can get him to doubt who he is, he's one. You know what? The devil wants to get us to doubt who we are in Christ. He, he, he's trying to do that. I heard something the other day. I've got to study it out a little bit more, but I believe it's true. Um, do you know Satan can't curse you? Did you know in Jesus Christ we have authority in the name of Jesus to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy? We've been raised up together with Christ, seated together with Christ at the right hand of the Father God. All the forces of darkness are underneath the feet of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan can't curse you. He can throw thoughts and ideas in your head. He can create storms and all kinds of stuff like that. But I, I can't find in the scriptures where he can curse you. But here's what he does. He gets people to use their own mouth to speak something different over their life than what God says and he gets us to curse our own life with our own mouth I see a little humor in this maybe you will too maybe you won't you want to know one way to shut the devil up shut your mouth <laughs> how many of you know sometimes there's a lot of truth in that we just ought to zip it Amen. We just thought, of, oh, wait, 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 because I, I know what's going on. And if I let what's going on up here come out here, that is not good. Because our words are full of life or they're full of death. James teaches us that out of our mouth come both blessings and cursings. <laughs> Friends, do not speak a curse over your own life. Don't do it. Don't let your mouth become an instrument of Satan. Amen? Jesus knew the word. He knew who, what he was. Uh, he knew who he was. Um, what was. What was Satan's first temptation? What, you know, what did Satan do to Eve? Did God really say? Did God really say? Well, is that really true? Friends, what God says about you is true. You are more than a conqueror. You are a head and not a tail. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. Amen? 
There was a reason Jesus spent time, I believe, during those 18 years. Because he knew that he was going to face a battle. And if, if you keep reading, I don't want to take the time to keep reading this, but then you know, you read down these, and it's, you know, Jesus is tempted by Satan like crazy. And we get to read about three of them. How did Jesus respond to every time the devil brought a temptation? It is written. Every time he said, it is written. It is written. You know what we're going to need to do to stay the course? Declare written. We're going to need to declare the Word of God over our lives to stay that course. And Jesus stayed the course. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. Um, I love this here. You know, you get into Luke chapter 4. Just go there with me. Oh, man. (laughs) I said I only had a few scriptures and it wasn't, that didn't mean it would be a short sermon. You thought I was joking. No. Um, Luke chapter 4. You know, why don't you just turn and look at somebody and say, you're awesome. Just, just tell the person next to you that they're awesome. Because you know how I'm feeling right now? I'm feeling like you guys are awesome. <laughs> you're just, what a blessing. Praise God. Hallelujah. And thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But Luke chapter 4. I'll pick it up at verse 16, uh, verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went throughout all the surrounding regions, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. <laughs> so he's handed this, this, this book of the prophet Isaiah. And what's he do? He finds the place. How did he know where it was? He'd spent time. He'd spent time. And, and he didn't do one of those random things that sometimes believers do and God shows such great mercy on, you know, <laughs> you know, oh God, I don't know where to read. Oh, okay, let's see. Thus says the Lord God, when you have gathered the, no, no, but that's how a lot of people do it. I don't think Jesus did it that way. He found the place. He found what was written about him. He found it. He knew what was written about him. He knew what God had said about him. And then I love, we're going to keep on reading. Um, And he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He knew what his father's business was, didn't he? He knew how to face the enemy The enemy when the enemy came, with it is written, and then he knew the word. He had spent some time. I tell you what, I must be about my father's business. I must be spending some time in the word. Why? Because there's going to be stuff come against us. I think of that verse of scripture where it says, um, uh, if, if, it, if the Lord hadn't shortened the days... Even the elect wouldn't have made it. What's that indicate? There's some stuff to go through. And, and there's a verse I got for us, but I love the Apostle Paul in the book of Timothy. This is my last verse of the morning. I just put it now. No, I, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> um, but Timothy said this, I have kept the faith. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. How many of us at the end of our life, we want to be able to say, I've kept the faith. I've run my race. I kept the faith. There is laid up for me. And, and you know, they believe that 2 Timothy was the last book that the Apostle Paul wrote. You read the scriptures right after that, and it lets you know. He knows his time to depart is coming close. And he could say at the end of his life, I have kept the faith. I tell you, I don't know about you guys. I think I do. I think it burns in you as well. 
Bob, I've watched you walk and live your life, and you're just passionate about serving the Lord. Been through some storms, been through some trials, but just, I'm going to keep the faith. I'm sticking with it. Anybody, how many, is there anybody else in here that doesn't want to keep the faith? Because if I ask the question the other way, it's kind of silly because you're here because you want to keep the faith. You want to stay steadfast, amen? Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. Uh, mm. Verse 20, I'll just start reading down through verse 24. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. Here we are in Acts 20, 20. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says this, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Do you know that there's a, there's a fight right there? There's a faith fight right there? <laughs> How many of you ever had something you know you were supposed to say, but you were going to have to say it in faith? You knew there would be opposition. You knew there would be resistance, but you knew you needed to say it anyway. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and Paul, he kept saying it. He, he kept going. Verse 21, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit... To Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. <laughs> Some of the stuff in front of Paul isn't all that pretty, is it? Chains and tribulations await me. But I love what comes next, verse 24. But none of these things move me. I have to ask this question at this point. What's moving you? I've got an illustration, but I'm not going to do it today. People have seen me do it in the past. I've got a whole bunch of ropes over there, all different lengths. And I, I get a volunteer, and the volunteer comes up here, and we start putting ropes around their wrist and their elbow and their shoulder and their neck and their waist and their chest and knees and everything. And then you've got people at the end of all of those ropes pulling on them. Guys, we all got stuff pushing us. We all got stuff pulling on us, all kinds of stuff pushing and all kinds of stuff pulling. We got, we got people pulling us. How many of you know you, you got to pay attention where you spend your time and who you spend time with? A dear friend of mine, Guy Dunnick, he shared this one time. He said, I got, he goes, I've got friends on, in, in three different levels. I've got friends who are more mature than I am. They know more than I do. They're more mature spiritually than I am. And he goes, I spend time hanging out with those friends because they challenge me. They challenge me to come up higher. They inspire me to, to just keep growing and that there's more and that I haven't arrived yet. And he said, so I spend time with those guys. And then he says, I got friends who are just my buds. We like the same things. We have fun doing the same things. We just hang out together. We just spend time. We don't necessarily go up. We don't necessarily go down, it, we can just breathe and rest and refreshing and have fun with each other. How many of you know that's important? And then he goes, I got friends who are younger than me and friends who are just getting starting out in the ministry and, and friends who don't even know the Lord. And he said, the real secret is to learn to spend the right amount of, friend, right amount of time with each group, each group of friends because your friends are going to influence your life. They're going to, and I, I, you know what? I love my friends. I love my buds and just hanging out there. But how many, even my buds feel this way? Brian's one of them. We just enjoy our company together. But we know we don't just want to be happy and it's all about he and I. Because he's got a passion for the lost. I love that about Brian. And that inspires me. You know? And, and so we, there's, there's things that take us up higher. Amen? Cause us to grow. But spending the right amount of time with each group, and it's really important. I'd like to throw this. Do you want to be a balcony person? Or do you want to be a basement person? What's the difference? Balcony people are always calling you up higher. Come on up. Come on up. There's more. There's more. There's more. Always calling. Basement people are calling you down. They're discouraging you. They're finding the fault. They're finding the negative. Man, you better, you better figure out how much time you're going to spend around each group. There was this uh, experiment that was done with monkeys. 
they were in this big pen. It was a good-sized pen, maybe as big as that room there, and it had a pole in the middle of it with bananas on the top. And they put four monkeys in there. And, and those four monkeys getting hungry, and they saw them bananas. So they start up to, one of them starts up the pole for the bananas and, bananas, and they pour water all over him. Monkey goes back down and try it again, and they do this for quite a while. And pretty soon, the monkeys quit going up the pole to get the bananas because they were tired of water getting dumped all over them. So they took one of the monkeys out, and they brought a new monkey in. And that new monkey saw the bananas on the top of the pole. And they thought, he thought that monkey, well, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get a banana. Those other three monkeys grabbed him and pulled him back down. They wouldn't let him climb the pole. Friends, God's got something in your heart. You run for it. And don't let the monkeys pull you back down. You got to go. And so, so they kept pulling that monkey down, and then they took one of the other original monkeys out, brought another monkey in. That monkey tried going up the pole. The other ones pulled him down. They did that with all the original monkeys. Then all the original monkeys that had water dumped on them were out of the pen. And then put a bunch of other monkeys in too, one at a time. Now there's like 16 monkeys in there, and none of those monkeys would go up the pole. And yet none of them had ever had water dumped on them. It was just all because of the monkeys around them pulling them down. Whew. I tell you what, I want to be a basement or a balcony person. I don't want to be a basement person. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to, I want to encourage. And, and storms are okay. We're going to go through storms. Storms try to move us. I, I remember hearing this. Anybody had any wind lately? <laughs> you know, and... Them trees get to rocking, and Diana and I, about a year and a half ago, had a tree in our yard break off and whew, take out our deck. Thank God it missed our house by about six feet, um, but it took out our deck and stuff. And now when I sit there and I look at them trees rocking, I'm just like, no, because you can see them out the window. But there's a good thing about those storms for trees, because that tree upstairs is rocking, and underneath those roots are being wiggled. And what they do is they push the soil away, and then the wind stops, and they got more room to grow down. And they get even stronger. They get even tougher. You know, and Paul goes, I know, I got chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. I would just challenge you to say, okay, what's trying to move you that you know is not of God? And, and sometimes it comes to people. Are there people in your life that are pulling you in directions that you shouldn't go? Now, sometimes you might just say, you know what? I can't spend time there because I, I, they're going to try to take me places I can't go. I remember somebody, they had friends in high school, and they came back to visit, and I was like, why don't you go down and hang out with your friends? They'd love to see you. And, and this individual said, I can't because I know where they are, and I know what they want me to do, and I'm not going there. They just, they just had to sever that. You know, I, I used to spend a lot of time in bars. Yep, evangelizing. I wasn't in there drinking. <laughs> no, I used to spend a lot of time. At, some of you are looking at me like, what? Yeah, I used to spend a lot of time in bars drinking. I'm not opposed to going into a bar. I don't drink. I haven't drank for 40 plus years, I think it is now. Yeah, it's 40 plus years but I don't go into bars a lot anymore. If God leads me into a bar, I'll go in there. And it's always interesting for a preacher in a small town where everybody knows you to walk into a bar. <laughs> I, I could watch some people get really uncomfortable really quick. <laughs> I, I've seen it happen. <laughs> it's funny. I, 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 God told me to go into a bar one time. A couple people in the church I was looking for them. They were going through some stuff, tough, tough stuff. And so I went into the bar and the best way to describe it is, they just looked guilty. <laughs> and, and it, you know, because they knew that was not a place they should be hanging out. A lot of things will try to pull on you. But none of these things move me. 
And I love something he said in here. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. You know what? Sometimes our own self can move us away from the things of God. Sometimes, nor do I love my, love my life. He wasn't even going to let his own wishes and wants, his own will, get him off the plan of God for his life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, friends, we're going to stop there. I got more verses of Scripture. Stay the course. Stay the course. Well, what's the course? You can take this away from, take this with you this morning. Here's a course. Spend time with your Heavenly Father. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word. Spend time getting to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen? And then in connection to that, be a balcony person. Be a balcony person. Be always building people up. Be always looking for the good charity. I know through you and Gabe and, and uh, Vaughn with uh, uh, Bethel, one of the things, and David, I've heard you say it, one of the things that they would say is, find the gold. Find the gold. Find the gold. Find the gold in people. Find the gold in people. Do you know there's gold in everybody? There's gold. What do we mean by gold? The good stuff. The good stuff. Look for the gold. Do you know anybody can find dirt? It don't take much to find dirt. That's easy. And, and please don't look too close at me. Because you'll find a lot of dirt. And you can pick on it if you want, and you'll find more dirt. That's what you want to do. See, you can find what you're looking for. If you want to find dirt, you can find it. And here's the dangerous thing about looking for dirt. Pretty soon, you make stuff up. You find stuff that actually isn't even there. You start to believe lies about people that aren't even true. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. People just, they just looking for something ugly and they find it and then they find more and then they find stuff that isn't even there. I tell you what, I love people. People are awesome. They're not perfect. In Christ Jesus, they are. People make mistakes at times. Amen? Oh, I'm going to end with this story. When my sister Anne passed away years ago, and uh, the, the bulletin that was handed out, there was this story, and my sister Anne had found it and had it put in the bulletin. Uh, you know, and she just said thank you. My sister Anne was heavy. Yeah, she was well over 200 pounds, sometimes close to 300 pounds, and about as tall as me, and as messed up as this world is, you know, sometimes that's not acceptable. But God made us all different, you know, and just not acceptable. But Anne had quite a few friends, and a lot of people accepted her, and she was just saying thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being my friend. Even though I don't fit the, the perfect of what the world says, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for loving me, accepting me. And uh, in this story, there was this guy, and he was at a beach. He was the only one there, and there was this cave that went into the, the beach. And he went into the cave, and he found this old leather sack. And it was one that had a string that tied it shut on the top. And he picked it up and had stuff in it so he opens it up gets outside and it's full of little clay balls about three quarters of an inch round how many of you ever did that as a kid you found mud that was just right and you could roll it into a clay ball and you just you made all these little clay balls you know how many of you made little clay squares you know but you did it you had fun with it this whole sack was full of those and he thought wow this is pretty cool so he went walking with it and he's on the shore and he takes one and pitches it out into the ocean and he does that for a while, throwing these clay balls out into the ocean. Then one of them falls and hits a rock and breaks open. There's a diamond inside it. You guys, there's a diamond inside of you. There's a diamond inside of every one of us. Amen? Find that. Find that. 
Focus on that. Amen? Find the good. I was at a funeral on Friday, and the minister did a wonderful job, and he just presented the message of salvation so clear. And like I said it when I was talking earlier today, there's one thing, folks, that will last forever. That's sitting right here in this room right now, and that's us. That's human beings. Chairs will be gone. The walls will be gone. The building will be gone. All that stuff will be gone. The only thing that will last forever is us. And we're a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. My question is, when you die, when you die, when you leave this world, where will you spend eternity? Do you know? Do you know? And, and knowing our, salvia, our salvation is a no-so salvation. I love in, in the gospel of John, not the gospel of John, but uh, 1 John chapter 5, it says this, He who has the Son has eternal life. He who has the Son has eternal life. Do you have the Son? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Can you say yes? Or is there anyone here that goes, I hope so? We don't have a hope so salvation. We have a no so. How do you get the Son? It's simple. You ask. You just ask. He came to give you life, and you just ask Him for it. And in the process, I found this to be true. How many people in here have trouble admitting that you've sinned? Not a hand went up. <laughs> so we're all on the same page then, huh? We have all sinned. Amen? How many of you have received the cure? Yes. Jesus. Jesus. If you're in this building today and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never said, Jesus, help me. I know I've sinned. I know I've blown it. I know I've messed up and I need help. And Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on a cross. I believe you shed your blood. I believe you took my place. I believe in you. And now, Jesus, I'm asking you to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to come into my life. If you've never done that, you can do that. And you can have eternal life in heaven. And you can give to loved ones the best thing you can give them when you leave. Thanks, cats. Thanks, Cass. Thanks for saying yes to Jesus. Thank you, because he's in my future. And a little more emotional today than most days, but I'll just cry a lot more on this one. Cass was like my big brother. I said that wrong. Cass played the role of my dad. So he's pretty special to me. But he's in heaven. Left me the best gift he could, knowing that. He's in my future. Hallelujah. Do you have Jesus Christ in your life? Is he your Lord and Savior? If not, you can invite him to be your Lord and Savior. Could we all go ahead and stand up? Amen. <clears throat> you guys doing okay? And I, I was tempted to ask a question that's full of doubt and unbelief. Should I still ask it? I think it's crazy that preachers do this. They preach a message, it's God's word, and, and, there's, there's, and then they go, anybody get anything out of that? I believe people got stuff out of that. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just like to pray for people. If I could get folks from the prayer team up, we're so close to being done. Um, but we just like to pray for people. Yes, Isaac. Thank you, Isaac. Where, where are our seniors at? Would you guys raise your hands, please? Okay, you see the seniors? Folks who are around the seniors, especially moms and dads, would you get close to those seniors? Seniors, keep your hands up. And then we're going we're gonna to just invite people to get around those seniors. We're going to pray for them. Amen. So if you've got a senior close to you, you might have to turn around and look around a little bit. If you want to walk out of your seat, you can. But at the same time we're doing this, if there's anybody that wants to come up here and receive prayer, you can come up here and receive prayer. If there's anyone in here you've never said yes to Jesus, you can say yes to Jesus. You could come up here and, and pray with these folks who are up here. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, start praying for the seniors right now. Just start praying for them. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you. And Father, as we're praying for the seniors and your blessing, your wisdom, your direction into their lives and on their lives, Father God, we thank you for that. And Father, we believe right now that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you minister to them through these folks praying for them. And God, you speak to their heart about your business for them. Thank you. And Father, we pray for moms and dads right now. I've walked down that path. Whether it's the, the first child graduating or the last one. It's, it's a chapter that gets moved on to the next one. So I pray for all the parents, God. You help them walk through this. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody in here, you, want, you, just, you just need someone to pray with you, need healing in your body. If that's the case, come on up here and let folks pray with you. Let them pray with you. God's a healer. If you're in this building and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can come up here and we'll pray with you. And you can get born again. Spend eternity in heaven. Hallelujah. God's a Savior. He's a Redeemer. He's a healer. Amen. Don't want to miss out. Don't want to miss out. Hallelujah. We're going to have a time of fellowship afterwards. Don't have to run out. You can walk into the other half of the building. Check it out. Oh, Father God, we worship you and we praise you. We love you, God. God, we give you the glory and the honor and we thank you so much. We thank you so much for your loving kindness to us. Thank you, Father, for your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that you told us you would never leave us nor forsake us, but you're with us always. So as we get ready to bring this part of our day to a close, we know that as we walk along throughout this day, you walk with us. You go with us where we go. Father, and we ask that through us in the coming days, you would work to take the love and the truth of Jesus to people around us. Give us wisdom and words with salt. And Father, for our time of fellowship and the caramel rolls and the other goodies back there, thank you. Thank you for Linda and Sharon, and thank you for all those who bring. Praise you and worship you, Father God. We love you. Thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, give somebody a hug. Give them a high five. Tell them how good they are. That will never come.